Well, welcome to this talk and um, particularly pleased today to welcome Topher Field all the way from Sydney, Australia. Topher, thank you for coming on. Well, look, not quite Sydney, Australia. Don't insult me like that. I've, uh, I'm no longer in the big cities. Uh, I've, I've moved out to a more regional area. So I was Melbourne based. But wh the reason you mentioned Sydney is because, of course, that's where we met was at an Australian Medical Professional Society event in Sydney. Mm. But it's good afternoon there and it's good morning here. So. <laughs> Indeed, indeed. I, well, look, I, in, in the spirit of solidarity, I've got a nice hot cup of black tea. Um, I hope you've done the same in good English tradition. I've had, I've had, uh, I've had about a pint and a half of tea this morning. Just to... uh, excellent, excellent. So well, we should almost, be almost awake. <laughs> <laughs> right, Topher, you've written a book, Good People Break Bad Laws. Now, of course, we're not advocating law breaking on this channel, but uh, <laughs> what, what, what motivated you to, uh, to write this book and what's the book about? Well, sure. It's about civil disobedience and, and civil disobedience in the modern age. It's a, there's a funny thing with civil disobedience. Most people recognize that it's right and a good thing when they look at it in history. You look at the civil rights movement in the United States or you look at various people pushing back against communism or Nazi occupation or these sorts of contexts. People can, can instantly say, oh, yes, they were doing the right thing, even though they were breaking the laws of the land at the time. But it's much more difficult for people to recognize proper civil disobedience in real time. Uh, and there is, I, I use the word proper very, very deliberately, there is such a thing as, as doing it wrong, doing it badly, just being lawless. And that's not what I'm advocating in this book and certainly would never advocate uh, on, on your channel. John, the last thing I want is for you to get to get a strike on your channel. I, we need you. We need you on, on the air. But no, it's not what I'm advocating at all. And in fact, there's quite a lot of the book is actually dedicated to this question of how do you know what a bad law is? What, what actually makes a law bad to begin with? If I say that good people break bad laws, we have to understand what a bad law is and, and, and why that is the case and bring it back to principles, fundamental principles that apply universally back to, back to essentially to human rights and to natural law. But also we need to then go, just because it's a bad law doesn't mean that we can do anything we want. There are the right ways to do these things and there are very much the wrong ways. And what we see at the moment around the world is a lot of organizations and a lot of people that are protesting or, or, or engaging in disobedience in really destructive ways, ways that are destructive to the people around them, but also destructive to their own cause. They're not winning any friends. They're not, they're not actually gaining any ground when they, when they engage in those sorts of activities. So I very much explain, explore, uh, and, and get down into the nitty gritty of what is a bad law? Why should good people break bad laws? And then once we've made the decision that we need to do that, that we're compelled by our conscience to have to break a bad law, how do we go about that so that it's constructive, so that we're not just creating trouble for ourselves or for those around us, uh, and so that we can actually do that in obedience to law and order? And it was, I believe it was Gandhi who actually said that one who disobeys a law that is in violation of their conscience is actually, it might have been Howard Zinn actually, I might be misquoting, I think it was Howard Zinn, is actually showing the highest respect for the law. Disobedience is actually a, a civil disobedience practiced properly is actually a correct and necessary and beneficial part of a functioning democratic society, of a functioning free society. And we are seeing this around the world at the moment. Various people are protesting in what we might call uh, robust ways. Some people might consider illegal ways sometimes. And how, how, do, how do we differentiate between, I think you've partly answered this, but how do we differentiate between these protests that I, I and many viewers here would see as completely unacceptable? Mm. about particular causes and and legitimate protest about just causes so there's two questions there really mm. how do we decide when the cause is a good cause and how do we decide the difference really between legitimate protest and anarchy really really important questions so l let me get to the to the first one which is uh, the way i phrase that is how do you know what what is a bad law and i propose two tests to determine what's what's a bad law one is a utilitarian test and the other one is a principles based test and before I explain both of those, I would say that you probably shouldn't engage in civil disobedience unless a law fails both, not just one. Now, the utilitarian test is, does obeying or enforcing this law cause more harm than breaking it? So if enforcing it or if obeying it would actually do more harm to others or to yourself without then benefiting others, if, if, the, net, if the net result 
would be more harm than good, then it is a candidate for a bad law. But we have to look at the principle as well. So, for example, during wartime, there might be a legitimate reason to have lockdowns or, you know, during World War II, during the Blitz, of course, they had people walking around telling you off if you had light coming out of your windows or various things like that. You could argue, oh, this is, this is doing harm. This is really, really crimping my social life, right? Whatever the, whatever the harm may be viewed to be. Uh, but they're in a situation there where the there is a another side to that harm, which is the harm that you would do to your neighbours if light was coming out and uh, and you were able to be able to be bombed. There are situations where we have to kind of put aside the utilitarian side of it a little bit. Uh, but the second principles based question is just as important, which is, does the government have legitimate authority to do this in the first place? You see, people like you and I, people in the Anglosphere, we at the very least pay lip service to the concept of limited government. We say, well, yes, the government should be limited. It's not that it should have the power to do anything it wants to anyone at once, for whatever reason it wants, at any time it wants. We, we all say, no, 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 the government should be limited. We have big arguments about what those limits should be and where we should draw those lines, but we all agree in principle the government should be limited. So then if you look throughout history, you can actually see that throughout the last few thousand years of political development, humans have tried time and time again to find and to devise different ways of limiting governments. You can look all the way back to your, your Greek experiments with, with various forms of democracies, etc. You look at your Roman Senate, you can come, you can fast forward through to the modern era where we have everything from uh, representative democracies, we have republics, we have constitutional monarchies, we have countries that have bills of rights, we have concepts like the separation of powers, the different branches of government that are supposed to hold each other accountable. All of these are different expressions of this this idea that, hey, we've got to find a way to limit the power of government. The government itself can become a problem if we don't successfully limit it. And so then I would challenge anyone to find one of those mechanisms that has actually worked consistently over the long term. Look at the US right now. The Fourth Amendment against, um, against unlawful search and seizure is violated on a, on a daily basis. They have to fight continuously for their First Amendment in the, in the courts. That at least is upheld you know, for the most part. So They're bills of rights... Of speech. Correct. Yeah, the freedom of speech laws. Um, so, so we see a situation there where they have a bill of rights that they're very, very proud of. But I would suggest to you that the American federal government is an absolute leviathan that is that is not obeying that, that bill of rights at all. In something like the Westminster system, we have a number of different mechanisms, multiple layers of mechanisms that are designed to ensure that the government remains accountable to the people. Um, I'm not sure what the mood is in the UK, but I'd suggest to you that uh, there's probably not a huge amount of accountability going on in Westminster, at least uh, not to this you know, political observer on the other side of, of the planet. We can look around and every single one of those mechanisms either has failed historically or is failing now. So then the question becomes, well, if we believe in limited government, how do we in practical terms actually enact that? How do we keep government limited? And the maxim that I propose is that the limits of government power are defined by the limits of the people's obedience. So if we believe in limited government, then we must accept this idea that there is a point where we individually, you, me, each person watching, chooses then to stop obeying, where we reach the limit of our obedience to that government because we say, no, hang on, you don't have a legitimate power to, to do whatever it is that you're now doing. So that's the second test is the principles test. So the first test is utilitarian. Does this, does obeying or enforcing this do more harm than breaking it does? I'm not a fan of utilitarianism as a, as a general precept because it can be twisted so easily and so much. Uh, almost every tyrant in history would be able to make a utilitarian argument as to why they're actually the good guy. So I, a utilitarian test is useful, but on its own is thoroughly inadequate. We have to add that principles-based test. Does a government, to go back to my, my example of the, the Blitz, does the government have the right to take measures during wartime to protect civilians and, and military assets, for example, making people cover their windows? Uh, yes, it does. It, it has the power to try and ensure its own survival and protect its people under wartime uh, emergency measures. And so something like that, even as much as I might not like it for my own personal life, it has merit and, and there is a principle there that a government can act on. When we come to something like COVID, which is where I really had to think through a lot of these things, I ended up on the front lines pushing back against COVID lockdowns and uh, ended up with criminal charges and all sorts of things. And that's really what this book is, is born out of, is my own experience there and then 15 years as a political commentator before then. When it comes to something like blanket lockdowns, locking every single person down, which we did in Melbourne, Australia, my, my former hometown, uh, 
shutting down schools, closing playgrounds, telling people they can't leave their house for more than one hour a day, and if they do, it has to be for a certain very limited set of reasons. They were arresting people for going outside and sitting on a park bench and getting sunshine, because even though they were allowed outside for one hour, they were required by the law to be exercising, and that couldn't be passive. You know, it didn't matter if you were 70 years old and you'd walked to the park, you couldn't sit down on that park bench and enjoy some sunshine uh, because the police officer would arrest you. And we actually saw that play out in reality. That's not a hypothetical. We saw that. It got to the point where we had grown men and women, police officers that had graduated from high school and then gone to the academy and passed all the application tests and then passed out of the academy itself and become police officers. Grown men and women were walking around checking people's coffee cups to make sure they had coffee in their takeaway cups because if they weren't drinking, then they had to have a mask on. And so people were carrying cups around with them so they wouldn't have to have the mask over their face. And we had grown men and women participating in this absolute nonsense pantomime. Uh, of, of sort of safety theatre, and this is something that you've covered very, very deeply with uh, with a lot of different guests and a lot of different research that you've covered. A lot of the measures that were taken were dubious at the time, and, and there's increasing research now to say that many of them were ineffective. And in fact, uh, I would argue that there's increasing evidence now that when it comes to the health of young people, uh, lockdowns and school closures and things can be demonstrated to have been counterproductive, at least for certain demographics. So when you have a threat that is a very clear threat to a certain demographic, the elderly, the, the infirm. We knew that by the end of March 2020 because of the data that came out of Sweden, Italy and Israel all in the month of March. We saw particularly the Swedish data really took me at the time because they broke it down not only by age group but also by comorbidity. And we could really see very, very clearly that risk curve that applied. And so when they started extending the lockdowns in Melbourne, Australia, so the, the, when they said two weeks to flatten the curve, that's what they said worldwide. They said the same thing here. I bit my tongue and didn't protest against that. I went along with it. I wore the masks and, and did all the things I was asked to do because there is at least a certain logic to two weeks. And the harm of two weeks is relatively limited. So I looked at that and went, okay, from a utilitarian point of view, I can understand where they're coming from. From a principal's point of view, I really don't think they actually have the authority to do that, but I'm not going to object because I can see from a utilitarian perspective, there's some logic here. Uh, and so I kept my mouth shut. I went, okay, I'll go along with this. And it was when they then added a third week, which, which instantly I understood what that meant. That meant that they weren't working to a plan. This wasn't a strategy. And they shifted all of a sudden from let's prepare the healthcare system across to let's have um, zero cases. Let's have, you know, donut days is what they were called here in Australia or here in Victoria. Uh, no one died of COVID. No one, no one was hospitalized with COVID. There were no cases detected. And as soon as that extra week of lockdowns was added on the end, that's when I understood this was, this was going to go very, very badly. And from that point on, I, I recognized, number one, from a utilitarian perspective, unplanned ad hoc lockdowns of everybody to fight a virus that has a clear risk profile. From a utilitarian point of view, it's going to be a disaster. And I believe I've been vindicated on that. And from an in principle point of view, I don't believe the government has the authority to infringe on people's rights when they haven't been found to actually have a disease. There is a place for quarantine if someone is found to actually be carrying a disease. There would arguably be a place for quarantine for people who have been direct contacts of someone who's been found to carry a disease. I don't believe that historically or in any of the modern medical literature, there is a robust argument for locking down six and a half million people even when no one in the population is known to have any of the disease at all. I don't see that the, the government has legitimate authority to do that. So from my perspective, they failed the utilitarian test. They failed the in-principle test. And that's when I began to stand up. And, and really, for the first time in my life, I'd been a goody two-shoes all my life until I was 38 years old. And then I walked out my door and I started to cause trouble. You think an argument could be made that the government were sort of... Um um, just being being very cautious, um, or, or, or you know, we can see clearly now that the lockdowns didn't work. All they did was kick it into the long grass for a period of time at best. Mm -hmm. But at at the time, do you think there was any possibility the government were just being cautious and trying to act in the best interest of their citizens? That argument does get made. Uh, the precautionary principle, we didn't know what we were dealing with, etc. These sorts of phrases get rolled out all the time. We've got a couple of inquiries going on in, in Australia at the moment and uh, people trying to defend themselves and defend their actions. 
The difficulty that I have with that is that I can go back into my own Facebook feed at the time uh, because somehow miraculously I managed to not get cancelled off Facebook despite all the things I was saying. And I can show you in real time, you know, by, by the end of March 2020, I'm posting um, the, the cautions being being penned by Professor John Ioannidis, uh, one, of the, one of the great epidemiologists and someone that other epidemiologists have to study in order to, to become epidemiologists. Um, you know, there, there was so much good literature and really good expert opinion. I'm not an expert. I don't claim to be. I don't, I don't make any statements in my own right or on my own authority. It's based on what I'm reading and understanding from people whose opinions I trust and, and make sense. And let me explain the make sense because there's some, some people really get this wrong in my opinion. What we saw was a battle between government approved experts and other experts who generally were not government approved and in fact were government censored. And I have an issue with any government approved expert because by definition they have to have passed through a political vetting process. Someone can become a professor at a university or a, a Nobel laureate, a Nobel Prize winning researcher or physician or any one of a number of other industry recognitions without ever having to pass through a political vetting process. But you don't become the chief health officer unless you've been approved by some politicians. And by definition, that makes their, their appointment political. Now, what does a politician want in a chief health officer? Well, largely speaking, what they want is the same thing they want from everyone else that they surround themselves with, all of the lobbyists, all of the advisors, all of the staffers, etc. And that is people that are going to help their career and help them to look good to the public. Now, there is certainly a degree to which that necessitates good medical advice, uh, but it also ne necessitates politically expedient medical advice. Now, let me explain what I mean by that, because I think this is one of the biggest issues, and I actually, I've dedicated a chapter of the book to this. The perverse incentive of the do-something reflex. Now, the do-something reflex is something we see in politics all of the time. Once a politician, once, once a, a problem is recognised and the media are saying, oh, there's this problem, all a politician has to do is say, I'll do something. And now they actually can't lose. Politically speaking, they're actually in a win-win position, no matter, no matter how it plays out from there. And if they say, hold your horses, we shouldn't do anything just yet, politically speaking, they're now in a lose-lose situation. We saw that with Sweden, with Anders Tegel and the courageous stand that he took and then the government of the day taking a courageous stand to then back him and his judgment. And they were castigated for, for years before they were, in my opinion, largely vindicated by the way the data has played out since. So if a politician says, we're going to do something about this, think about the available options. It might turn out that it was a media beat up and there was nothing really there to start with. And if that's the case, they can claim credit and say, well, it's a good thing we did something. It turned out to be, you know, we, we, we solved the problem because we took decisive action. If it turns out that there really is a big problem and it becomes a, a public health disaster, let's say in the case of something like COVID, then the government can say, well, it's a good thing we did something. Can you imagine how bad it would have been if we hadn't? So the minute they do something, whether it's real or whether it's not, doesn't matter, they win. There's a, there's a narrative in which they win. The minute they say, hey, hold your horses, let's not do anything, if it turns out to be nothing, they're never going to get credit for it. The media are not going to turn around and run headlines saying, our prime minister was right. It's, it's never going to happen. And in fact, they're going to get blamed for stuff that really wasn't caused by this supposed impending disaster anyway. So they're still going to get bad headlines, even if it turns out to be nothing. And if it turns out to be something and it really is bad and they should have done something about it, well, then their career is obviously over at that point for obvious reasons. So there's this powerful, compelling political incentive to do something. And it doesn't really matter what the something is, whether it'll work, whether it's proportional. None of those things really matter. What matters is doing something. And in that context... When you pick or appoint your chief health officer and you apply that political lens of, I need a chief health officer that's going to give me good political advice as well as good medical advice, you're going to bias towards the person that wants to intervene, the person that wants to do something all the time. And that, to me, is largely why we saw all these governments around the world taking largely similar steps at broadly the same time. Some people have wanted to say, oh, it was a conspiracy, it was coordinated, it was this, it was that. I don't tend to follow that line of reasoning at all. I tend to follow the maximum. You know, show me the, the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. And I, I think that's what we saw at play. We saw the political do something incentive at play. And that's also the incentive that we saw in the selecting of those government appointed experts. So to come back to your question, no, I, I don't have a lot of time for this argument of, oh, but they didn't know what was going on. You know, we, should, we, we needed to apply the precautionary principle. Uh, what we needed to do was to follow the pandemic plans that were already in place in 2019. 
until we had good solid scientific evidence based on which to vary those plans. Those plans were developed for a reason, and they were based on actual medical historical evidence, and had they been followed, which is in particular protecting the vulnerable, vulnerable populations, equipping the, the healthcare system to be able to deal with it, yes, trying to develop a vaccine as quickly as possible, all of those things could have and should have been done. Um, and, and this widespread lockdown kind of panic reaction was, in my opinion, was never justifiable and was certainly not justifiable beyond about April of 2020. This do something impulse, you certainly see it in healthcare as well. I've seen it in first aid situations, for example, where you might have a, uh, I've been in a situation where there's an unconscious patient that's been traumatized, they're breathing perfectly well, they've got airway breathing circulation. Mm -hmm. And some first aider will come in along and say, oh, do something. Let's turn them into the semi-prone position. But they don't know if they've got a cervical spine fracture or not. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, th this idea that you just have to do something. And you see it repeatedly. Um, it really is very often that the best intervention is to do nothing. And we have to decide that. And uh, well, have, we have the courage to do that. Completely agree. We need to kind of take some of these principles that, that have historically been yes. in medicine, but they arguably been abandoned, particularly first, do no harm. Yeah. Can we get that to be a principle in politics, please? Can we just have yes. all of our politicians, every time yes. they look at a piece of legislation or, or a change to the rules, go first, do no harm? Does this pass that test? Because a lot of the stuff we're seeing today doesn't. Mm -hmm. And it just occurred to me, it's somewhat outside the scope of this discussion, really, but if the chief medical officer is a political appointment then mm. perhaps you know, that applies to the chief scientific officer and various other government sponsored, in fact, probably arguably all the government sponsored uh, institutions where the government has a role in, yeah. in appointing who gets what. Uh, and of course, in, in who's recognized for doing what, the, the, uh, the infamously questionable honours system in my country, for example, mm. um, where, where uh, political people get slightly more uh, honours than, than others do. And, uh, the other Which question in my mind, Topher, really here is this, this arguably we've seen this move towards totalitarianism illustrated by the pandemic. Mm. Now, I don't recognise this in the UK. And as far as I understand it, the Australia of my youth mm. um, uh, is OK. There, were, there was arguments, there was debates, but we, 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 the, the principle of free speech was honoured. And, and uh, the principle of individual autonomy was was honoured, and, um, and there was always faults. But 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 uh, it seems to me there's been this drift towards authoritarian control. And do, do you think this started in the COVID pandemic, or did the COVID pandemic just sort of um, bring to light that which was already developing? Mm. It started in the 50s and 60s and accelerated after the end of history. You, you may recall the end of history was proclaimed with the, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall and then the end of the Soviet yeah. Union. 89, and, yeah. And what we saw through from, from the 50s and 60s, you know, the long march through the institutions was a deliberate conscious um, strategy that was engaged in as a, as a form of geopolitical sort of struggle without the need for, for bullets. And people laugh, oh, McCarthyism, all the rest of it. Well, okay, so there was certainly some, there was some wrongdoing there, but there were also deliberate efforts to infiltrate the US and other Western countries with Soviet agents and try and get them into positions of power. And what we saw was a cultural march through the institutions. And when I say cultural, what I mean was it, it wasn't government directed. It's not that the Soviet government were, were putting people into our universities and into our, our entertainment uh, industry and these sorts of places. But people of a certain ideological bent, what we would recognise as left wing, although I, I think the right wing are just as responsible for our slide into totalitarianism in, in modern history. Um, but what we would generally recognise as left wing, big government, socialist, uh, communist type thinkers have just gradually and, and faithfully worked their way into positions of influence. They control most of the large government bureaucracies. Uh, they make up a significant uh, minority, if not arguably a majority, of our politicians, if you include socialists rather than just hardcore communists. Uh, they certainly have taken over many of our educational institutions, and they are the ones who hold the minds of our younger people in the palms of their hands for, for a decade or a decade and a half if someone goes to university. And they've succeeded largely in this. So I would say the march through the institutions is, number, is, is part one. I would say that the, the cloud pivot strategy is basically the playbook uh, 
that they are working the what to. What strategy? Sorry. So Cloud Piven. So these were these were they were a couple. They authored a book together, and essentially what they were doing was they were advocating a shift to communism via the collapse of of capitalism. And their method to collapse capitalism was to overburden it with an unsustainable social welfare system. And I would argue whether you whether you think that they succeeded individually or not, what they set out to do is exactly what's happening right now. In the UK, you cannot afford your NHS. In the US, uh, they are up to their eye, well over their eyeballs in debt. Here in Australia, we're having issues where where roads aren't being fixed. You're uh, ramping issues with with ambulances parked outside of hospitals because there are no beds inside, and we're just pouring money into you know windmills and solar farms whilst we have some of the most expensive electricity in the world, and our cost of living is spiralling out of control, and inflation's in the double digits. If you if you believe kind of the grassroots numbers rather than the official ones, so. Whether you believe it was because of Cloward Piven and, and the strategy that they articulated and other people then celebrated and, and pursued, or whether you just think it's a coincidence, what they set out to do is exactly what's happening right now. We have overburdened capitalist countries with an enormous bureaucratic state and an enormous welfare burden that is not sustainable in the long term. Now, their objective was to collapse the capitalist system and to bring in a communist system. That's, it's, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's there in black and white. It's literally what they, what they wrote about. Um, and I would say that what we've ended up with are people in positions of power in politics, etc., who are, if not maliciously, certainly recklessly pushing us further and further into that overburdened, oversized welfare system that ultimately has to lead to some sort of a correction or some sort of a collapse. No one knows exactly when, but we can all see plain as day, it's not sustainable forever. You can't just keep on doing this forever. And yet somehow, even in Australia, uh, we have politicians who are still pushing us further down that path. And you say, well, can't you see the problem? Well, yes, they can. They don't see it as a problem. They, they are quite happy with the idea that we will reach the point where capitalism kind of keels over because they believe that they'll be a part of the rebuilding of something better on the other side. And that's that, that, that's that totalitarian instinct rising that you identify. They believe, and we see this you know, personified in Klaus Schwab with the World Economic Forum, but people have kind of turned him into a bit of a cartoon character, a sort of a, a Bond villain, a bit over the top. The, the reality is you don't have to look at him. You look at the, the World Economic Forum, look at the World Health Organization, look at the UN more generally in a lot of NGOs, and then look at our politicians. The one thing that unifies them, despite all of their differences and all of the, the policy differences and the fights that they may have and election, election conflict that they may have, they are unified by the belief that they know better than you. They know better than the common man and that the world would be a better place if only everyone handed all of the power over to them and let them make all of the decisions. And this is essentially what we're now seeing. We saw it during COVID. We've seen it throughout history. We saw it with, you know, with the, the, the um, Russian revolution, the, the communist revolution in Russia. We saw it with Mao's great leap forward in China. I saw it with my own eyes in Venezuela in 2015, the devastating consequences in Caracas City. And we watched it play out again with, with COVID. This is a totalitarian instinct amongst the people that have made that long march through the institutions successfully. They now hold the commanding heights, as Stalin would have called them, of the economy. They hold those positions of power and influence, politically speaking, culturally speaking, economically speaking. And now they're using those, not necessarily in some coordinated fashion, but because it aligns with them ideologically, they're using that power to push us further and further towards a, a total control, centralised system. I've seen the devastating effects of total power as well in, in Cambodia. I, I worked in mm. Cambodia with Khmer refugees in the early 80s. And at that time, Paul Pot, the Angkor regime, was still alive. And of course, people probably remember the film The Killing Fields. Mm. You know, a huge percentage, two, maybe two million people, uh, Khmer people were killed. All, all, all my workers, all my refugees I was working with, all had lost relatives, all had been abused. Yeah. You know, they, they were just deeply, deeply traumatised people. Now, the fact that this is happening all around the world. So Australia seems to be kind of. You know, you imagine Australia as having a particular culture, but when you when you go there, it's actually feels much the same as the UK. You, you feel like you've got the same constraints on free speech on you. And yeah. it's it, Canada, of course happening massively in Canada, yeah. New Zealand, um, around the world. Is, is, is this coordinated in some way or, or is it, how, how come it's happening all these places around the world at the same time? 
Yeah, look, there are certainly people that argue that it is coordinated, and there's no question, you know, world leaders meet up all the time. They're, they're having closed-door conversations all the time. Are they sitting there, you know, with Machiavellian uh, Bond villain laughs about how they're stripping everyone of their rights? Well, no, I don't think so. I think in their minds, they're the good guys. They're doing the important hard work that, that you and I, the common person, we just don't understand. We don't really, we don't have their intellect. We don't have their perspective on the world. We just, you know, they are just misunderstood whenever they get criticized. But let's go through a few of those countries uh, sort of in turn. New Zealand, obviously, under Jacinta Ardern, she made a play to literally become the single source of truth. That was literally the phrase that came out of her mouth. We will continue to be your single source of truth. She was talking about COVID at the time and COVID information. That really is saying the quiet part out loud. And it's no coincidence, I don't think, that she was a World Economic Forum Young Leaders graduate. Uh, again, birds of a feather. They've gone over to the, to the World Economic Forum. They've gone over to Davos. They've graduated from that program. And then, of course, they're being promoted and they're promoting each other. It's, it's kind of like a, I guess, a new age version of, of um, I don't know, some sort of a club. You know, where, yeah, we where, call where, it the old boys network. Yeah, the old boys. It's, it's a new age the, version the, the of the old school network. tie. Yeah. Uh, and now girls are allowed. We saw that with, with Jacinta Ardern. Um, we see, though, what's interesting with New Zealand is they have a single house of parliament. They don't have a, a, a split system, oh, okay. which... I think a split system is better. I think it's more stable. Um, but this single House of Parliament means that in a single election, they can actually radically change direction. And, and that's what they've done. They threw out Jacinta Ardern. They brought in a co coalition of much more freedom-friendly parties. Uh, it's not all roses, but it's, it's certainly a, a backlash and a step in the right direction there. Canada is an interesting one. I'm not going to commentate on that because I don't follow it really closely enough, except to say that Justin Trudeau, to me, appears to be the personification of someone who just believes that they should be able to tell everyone how to live and everyone should just do as they're told by him. That's my opinion. But we look at the UK, and, you know, historically, traditionally, this is a country that has been the seat of freedom. This is where we, you know, yes, it, you, know, you can trace it back further, but really we inherited things like freedom of speech. The UK, Carter, of course, you know, we talk about it in everyday uh, speech. Um, you know, the, the the UK, of course, through uh, through the incredible work of um, of Wilberforce and many many others, were, mm -hmm. were the first to abolish slavery as an empire, to to abolish slavery, and and really, then when they they abolished the slave trade, and then they went on uh, actually just a few days before um, before um, Wilberforce died. They actually abolished slavery itself rather than just the slave trade. And uh, he, he lived just long enough to hear that news, which is a, a wonderful sort of Hollywood ending, which is rare in real and, and life. And we used our military forces to, to liberate slaves in the Atlantic. Yeah, correct. And, and, yeah. You know, for all of the ills that have also been committed under that flag and in that name, this, this is a tremendous heritage, a tremendous legacy of, of freedom and of the pursuit of better, not just settling for how things are, but saying actually... We think this thing about ourselves might be wrong, and we're going to go on and actually harm ourselves. In, you know, there were many that argued getting rid of slavery is going to be terrible for us economically. Uh, you know, many people made that argument, but it, but it was done because it was believed to be the right thing to do. And now we see a situation where um, the the common Englishman has very few rights compared to. I don't know, someone, you know, living in, on a Caribbean island somewhere, what, what would historically have been viewed as savages in that era of sort of global exploration and conquest, they now live with more freedom than the Englishmen. And this is quite an astonishing situation that is now kind of unfolded. Here in Australia, uh, there's a Clive James quote, which I think really sums us up very, very well. And that is that the problem with Australians is not that they're descended from the convicts. It's that so many of them are descended from the jailers. And this is what we forget, is that jailers came over on the first and second and third and fifth, etc. fleet as well. And once they'd finished their, their duty and done their years, they were given land and they settled and they made new lives here in Australia. And unfortunately, what I would have to say is was proven by COVID was that the jailer culture has very much become the dominant one in Australia. And the, the, the rebellious prisoner culture, which I wasn't raised in, but I adopted uh, later in life, uh, is very much the exception now. And, and unfortunately, even after all the madness that we saw in Melbourne, which I documented in my documentary, Battleground Melbourne, um, even after all of that madness, 18 months of the craziest lockdowns, rubber bullets being fired on the streets, armoured vehicles on the streets, people like me who are just political commentators daring to speak out online, being arrested and given criminal charges, for, for my words, 
Uh, after all of that madness, Premier Daniel Andrews still got re-elected, and he got re-elected with a solid, a solid vote. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a close thing at all. And I had so many people reach out to me after that and say, Topher, was it rigged? It must have been rigged. And I said, no, it's worse than that. It wasn't rigged. Um, and that's the devastating reality of, of we saw the psychological, I don't know if you want to go into the psychology of all of this or not, but this is something I've, I've looked at and thought about very, very deeply. The psychology was fascinating. And I think it's going to be studied for many, many decades to come. I do want to talk about the psychology, but, but for first, um, was, he, was the reason he was re-elected to do with the control of information? No, I don't think so. Certainly, he had control of, of the media, uh, and Western governments do this now. They, they have a large budget, um, taxpayers' dollars, of course, not their own money, to spend on public service messaging. Uh, I don't know how it is in the UK, but in Australia, yeah. federal governments and state governments, they're not allowed to spend taxpayers' money on party advertising or anything like that, but they can yeah. spend yeah. Money on you know, public service announcements. And so we see this steady drumbeat of this public messaging that is really meaningless. You know, I remember once they were going to do some upgrades to some, uh, some metro lines, some train lines, and they put out this big, big build campaign and they were big full page ads in newspapers and 30 second ads on TV and all, this thing, all these things. Just be aware there's going to be some interruptions to some train services. It's all part of the big build. And you're like, well, anyone that rides the train regularly, you could just put posters up at the train station, um, you know, maybe do something online on the booking website or something like that. You don't have to spend a couple of hundred million dollars on a, on a public awareness campaign because there's going to be some changes to some timetables. But the reality is, of course, that wasn't about the public messaging. That was about the fact that being the biggest advertising customer of the newspapers, television stations and radio stations gives them an incredible amount of leverage. And that's what we saw behind closed doors going on. Uh, was essentially um, networks being intimidated out of allowing people to dissent on their platforms with quiet threats of um, of advertising being pulled. And of course, they're all financially, they're all hanging by a thread. If you lose a $20 million a year government contract because they decide they don't like that particular commentator of yours, uh, then that's that's devastating. You lose the entire network. So there's an enormous amount of leverage there. So to, to answer your question, did Daniel Andrews and, and the Labor Party have an, an enormous amount of influence over the messaging? Yes. Is that what won them the election? I'm going to say no for two reasons. Number one, because we actually were very effective at getting our message out. Thanks to the alternative media, thanks to social media platforms. Yes, we had to be careful how we said things and which platforms we said what on. And there were a lot of challenges, but we did actually successfully get our message out. So, so that's point number one. It's not like no one had heard of us or heard what we were doing. But point number two that I would, I would say my reason for saying that, that no is because people have proven themselves to be remarkably immune to new information. And there's that saying, you can't change someone's mind with facts if they didn't use facts to make up their mind in the first place. And, and this is a, an interesting situation. This will probably come in when we talk about the psychology later. People actually, they, they didn't just tolerate the lockdowns, they loved them for psychological reasons. It's actually the best years of their of some of their lives. And they are not going to let go of that by being presented with facts about the effect of school closures on children or any, no, no amount of facts is going to change how they feel about how amazing those years were for them for, for various psychological reasons. So no, I, I think he won because whilst um, Stockholm might have, um, you know, four, four prisoners in Stockholm might have uh, had the, the Stockholm syndrome named after them for uh, hostages after a, a botched bank heist, it was, it was four and a half million people who live in Melbourne that have actually perfected Stockholm syndrome and turned it into a, a genuine art form. I mean, personally, I'm concerned about the control of information globally, mm. um, you know, I have to put forward certain types of information, not put forward other types of information and put forward some types of information in, in an alternative way. Yeah. Uh, using using things that may appear uh, to be quite frank, uh, silly, mm -hmm. um, sort of strategize. And yeah, I really shouldn't have to do that. You know, um, do, do, do you see looming threats to freedom of speech and global communication coming up? 
Oh, for sure. And But this isn't new. Let me go back in history just a little bit. About 12 years in, in Australia, we had a Prime Minister, Julia Gillard. It was a, a judge, a retired judge, uh, put forward a report. It was called the Finkelstein Report. Uh, and this was to do with, uh, he proposed essentially a new bureaucracy called the News Media Council. Uh, and yes, if you've read 1984 recently, it was exactly that. It was it was the Ministry of Truth. And it was proposed with a straight face. He absolutely meant it. And there was going to be an independent body of people who are all completely appointed by the government. And we've, we've talked in depth about that already. As soon as someone's appointed by the government, they are politicized. But they were going to be independent and they would decide what the media was and was not allowed to say. Now, I, as a political commentator at the time, and, and many other good Australians raise a lot of noise about that, we kicked up a fuss and we, we had that thrown out. They, they didn't even proceed to try and get it through as legislation. They completely canned the entire idea. So that was good, but of course, that's never going to be the end of the story. Give it another decade and it's going to come back in some form or other. And that's exactly what we're seeing now. But it's it, interesting. It, it is coming back now. We have various initiatives, shall we say, around the world. Yeah. It's interesting in Australia, they've, they've proposed a thing called the Misinformation Disinformation Bill. And this is all you know, motivated by the supposed misinformation that went around during COVID. Of course, uh, you know, misinformation is just stuff that turns out to be true about one and a half to two years later. Uh, you, know, you know that better than most, John. So they put forward this bill. And again, we kicked up enough of a ruckus that they've kicked the can down the road. And the, the bill is not being debated. It's not actually progressing through Parliament at all. It hasn't been officially thrown in the bin, but it's not really going anywhere. And I'm noticing this as a trend, and I think this is a really amazing silver lining coming out of COVID, is that there are a lot more people now politically engaged and politically aware, and they understand the need to not be passive anymore. We got away in Australia, we got away with being passive for a very, very long time. We were very, very lucky. And a lot of Australians have realized we, we can't get away with that forever. We're not going to get away with that forever. And we're seeing people get more engaged. So I'm quite optimistic, even though absolutely we're seeing everything from these pandemic powers that the World Health Organization want through to information bills, through to the pressure. You know, look at the Pfizer papers and, and what was revealed. Uh, sorry, excuse me, not the Pfizer papers. Look at the, um, the Twitter files and what was revealed there, the collusion. I believe it was over 4,000. Don't quote me, but I believe it was over 4,000 times where the Australian government in one capacity or another asked Twitter to take down content, including content that was actually speeches given by elected MPs in Parliament. So these are speeches given under parliamentary privilege by people that we, the people, appointed to be our representatives. And the government is reaching out to Twitter and tapping them on the shoulder and saying, hey, you'd better, you'd better take that down. And of course, in almost every case, they complied. Does it concern me? Absolutely. The silver lining from all of the madness that we saw during COVID is that people are beginning to get organized and to push back in numbers that I don't think we would have seen without COVID having happened. I don't know how it was in Australia, but in my country, unfortunately, some politicians accidentally deleted their their WhatsApp messages, so uh, they couldn't be read, which is unfortunate. It's, yes, I did, I did hear about that. It's um, you know, you'd think they would make the the delete button just a little bit harder to find, you know, yeah. just just because obviously people of goodwill don't want to lose all of that you know sort of personal history uh, there, which I don't know on rare occasions might be of public interest. I don't know. Yeah, quite 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 incredible. Mm. Um, we, we've actually met before at this conference in Sydney, and we looked at, looked at some historical cases. Mm. Um, there's that famous picture of uh, August Landmassa, mm. uh, which I'm actually showing now. Um, yeah. People are better to see that. Uh, picture taken in 1936. Um, well, what, what is his story, and, and, and does, it, does he have implications for the current day? Well, he's one of my heroes and, and was actually one of my heroes before COVID, but through COVID and through my own activities as you know, becoming a dissident, becoming an enemy of the state, if you will, um, I felt I had a slightly stronger connection, not, I mean, not comparing what we went through to what he went through, but I felt a slightly stronger connection uh, to him in that photograph. So it's, of course, a famous photograph. Everyone will have seen it before. And there he is. Uh, with his arms crossed when everyone else is obeying and doing the socially acceptable thing and joining in that sort of mass formation, as we've, we've heard others discuss. Now, August Landmesser was actually a member of the Nazi Party not long prior to that photograph being taken. He was a dock worker, and being a member of the Nazi Party was kind of like being a, a union member now. Uh, it's quite ironic that the, that the Nazis were actually um, you know, attacking unionists 
because they were, in a way, they were their own form of, of union in one sense while they were in opposition. And August Landmesser was, uh, was a member, and then he fell in love with a Jewish girl and quickly discovered that um, everything that he'd been told and all of that hate that was kind of built into the, the undercurrent, and then obviously as time went on, the over, the, you know, not the undercurrent anymore, the entire uh, edifice of, uh, of Nazi ideology, was, was wrong. And he discovered that at a very deep personal level because he fell in love with one of these people that was supposed to be evil. Uh, he married her, they had two children, and um, sadly she did not survive the war, his wife did not survive the war. He actually died, uh, I believe it was in a labour camp, if my memory serves me correctly. I think it was a penal uh, regiment where, where they were used as cannon fodder. Yeah, that's, that's, it's quite possible. I don't, I don't recall the details. Uh, but I believe one of his children did survive the war. And uh, that's partly how we know who that person is, is, is that they, they were identified that way. But it's an incredible story. And the thing that I find incredible about August Landmesser is that he didn't know when, that, when he, he took that stand that anyone was going to take a photo or that anyone was going to care about that photo, that it was going to become this emblem of, of someone standing up for what was right in the way that it did. I, I liken it a little bit to the tank man in Tiananmen Square in, in China where he stood in front of that tank with his shopping bags in his hand, and this entire column of tanks comes to a stop. He did that because something in him compelled him to do that. It wasn't a photo opportunity. He didn't know there was a BBC camera crew up on a rooftop that was going to capture this moment. August Landmesser didn't know that that moment was going to be captured for posterity's sake. He just knew that that was the right thing to do. And for me and for those who stood with me during you know, the, the madness of the lockdowns in Melbourne, there was a real resonance with that. We didn't know if we were going to win, lose or draw. We didn't know, we really didn't care whether anyone was going to remember us or our names. The only thing that actually mattered was to try and leave a legacy where there, was, there would be proof of some kind that there were people who stood when it mattered, that we didn't all just fall into line and obey and bow that some of us are actually still Australians. Some of us still have that convict blood in us uh, and we're not easily pushed around and easily pushed over. And you don't know in advance what it is that you're going to do that, that lasts and stands the test of time and, and, and outlives you. Uh, you don't know in advance that anything that you do is going to outlive you. But we just had faith that if we all continue to pitch in and do what's right, then sooner or later, one of us is going to manage to do something like August Landmesser did, that future generations will be able to look back on and say they weren't all the same. They weren't all sucked in. Some of them stood for what was right. And I was in Prague recently at the Yang Palach Memorial and the Yang, mm. uh, Yang Zadek Memorial. Mm. Two young men who self-immolated in 1969 as their protest against the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. And um, mm. I think it just shows that sometimes this is going to be expensive. This, there could be self-sacrifice involved. Mm. Uh, oh, no. in it's a very humbling, very humbling shrine to, to visit. And the, it's a Sorry, it's a slightly different thing, but um, during yeah. the worst of the lockdowns here in, in Melbourne, there were two instances that I'm aware of where people in distress, in, in you know, mental distress, and um, their life circumstance having obviously become unbearable, actually uh, self-immolated in their own cars on two, two separate incidents. Uh, and there was one incident um, where someone tragically actually stabbed themselves to death in a supermarket, and I, I saw the video, someone sent me the video of that, um, and this was this was really when things were at their worst, and people were were just genuinely at their at their absolute wits' end. And of course, nothing was ever said on the news. Nothing was ever acknowledged about any of that. Uh, and in fact, if you dared to suggest, as I did, that lockdowns were doing uh, harm to people's mental health, you were accused of being irresponsible. Oh, we don't talk about that. We don't talk about suicide. We don't talk about mental health, which I think is part of the problem in in and of itself. And one of the things that I think we need to we need to really be trying to hold those in power account for, uh, to, to account for, is, is the effect that those lockdowns and those measures had on, on the mental health of whether it be business owners, mums, dads, children, the elderly, the people that died alone that didn't have to, um, you know, the, the young people, the children, the, the, the teenagers that missed out on their last conversations with their grandfather or their grandmother because they, they weren't allowed to visit. There is a lasting legacy, a lasting... Um, wound uh, 
I think, in the soul of a lot of people in, in Melbourne City. It's, it feels like a very sad place to me now when I visit. Now, part of that would be my own lens and how I view it. Some of that would be a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. But I'm not the only one to, to have observed it. And I think that there is an ongoing wound in people's psyche for the unresolved and unrecognized mental impact that was had. And the fact that if you even acknowledge it, you get told off for it. It's, it's, the, it's the wound that dare not speak its name. You're not even allowed to talk about the effect on people's mental health. And I think that that's going to be one of the, one of the reckonings that will come, obviously, along with other things, medical interventions that uh, may not have had the desired effect or maybe did have the desired effect, depending on who you talk to. Um, you know, there's the reckoning there, but there's also an enormous reckoning that needs to be had around mental health, particularly for younger people, but, but mm. generally for the population at large. Mm. So the legal measures in Melbourne, for example, that were implemented, do we need to differentiate between the individual police officers, officers for example, who were enforcing this and the government officials? How do we, how do we sort of yeah. unpick, yeah. unpick culpability, if you like? So this is a great one. Um, this is a great question because, uh, and again, sorry to make the analogy, and I'm not saying that they were the same, but we can learn from history. We saw them grappling with the same question when they were um, taking various Nazi uh, leaders and soldiers and so forth through, through courts after the end of the Second World War. And there was correctly, in my view, a recognition of the need to differentiate between those who were giving orders and those who were following, pardon me, but also a need not to accept this idea of, oh, well, I was just following orders, so therefore I'm blameless. Like, that's not acceptable, and we can't, we can't allow that to become the standard. And yet there is a difference between the person giving the orders and, and following the orders. And I, I have a number of police officers now who are, who are friends of mine and, and became friends of mine through all of this. One is, is Crystal Mitchell. She was an acting senior sergeant. She resigned very publicly out of the Victoria Police in protest over what the Victoria Police were doing. Uh, another one... Um, Roland Crystal was, I believe, a Queensland police officer. Uh, and another one who I won't name is still a serving member. And, uh, and I actually just caught up with them just the other day. Uh, we had a coffee. And, and so I'm, I'm not speaking in total ignorance here when I say that there, were, there was a lot of difference between different officers. There are pol Victoria police officers who were very proud of the fact that they never handed out a single COVID fine. They never find someone for being out of their house. They never find someone for being too far away from their house, for not wearing a mask, for any of the nonsense. There are many officers who simply called in sick any time they were tasked with combating the protests that I was a, that I was a part of. And just for American listeners, uh, when 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 people outside of America say protests. What we mean is what you would call a rally. We don't mean Black Lives Matter, burn everything down, mostly peaceful. We mean people holding signs and chanting uh, and singing songs and, and marching through the, through the streets. So we were holding rallies as pro in protest against these lockdowns and the police were being sent out in enormous numbers, literally by their thousands, depending on which particular day. The level of violence from the police was extreme. We saw numerous protesters being hospitalized um, from p literally just assault from police members. They would be in conversation with one police member and then they'd be tackled to the ground and spear tackled so their head hit the ground. Uh, that happened on, on multiple occasions. A woman by the name of Anna, she was in her 70s. She was hospitalised at a protest that I was at. She was only about 100, 100 metres or so behind me. I wasn't aware of what happened to her at the time. But that went viral with a lady in a red jacket being thrown to the ground by a senior sergeant. She was hospitalised. Um, you know, many more people were hospitalised in many different ways. Matthew Lawson, who I got to know through all of this, he was a uh, he was a peacemaker in the protests, and um, he would get himself in between because there were hotheads in in um, in our numbers. There were people that I wish hadn't been there, uh, because for reasons that I talk about in my book, uh, how you protest is just as important, and how you engage in civil disobedience. And these people were going about it the wrong way, and so. Um, so Matthew Lawson took it upon himself to be in between the police and the hotheads, and he would always put himself in harm's way to defuse the hotheads and get him to just, you know, rack off, go, go away, disappear into the crowd. We don't want you here. We don't need you here. This is not helping. And so he put himself in harm's way at protest after protest, dealing with and defusing the handful of idiots that were unfortunately in our ranks. Uh, and he wound up for his trouble. He wound up being the first person to get shot with, with rubber bullets. Um, because he was he he was challenging a police officer and saying what is that when they, he saw the the rubber bullet firearm that they had 
Um, and they, uh, they gave him a live demonstration, let's just say, uh, straight into his abdomen, and he's had four surgeries since, trying, you know, fixing the, the various abdominal and internal injuries that resulted as a result of a point-blank range rubber bullet into his, into his gut. So there's no question that there were police officers that really got into it. They really enjoyed their role as, dare I say, brown shirts. There were other police officers that wanted nothing to do with it, and they avoided it, they called in sick, they used every trick in the book, they took mental health leave, all sorts of different things. And there's one particular police officer that stands out to me. He was caught on camera, uh, a protester, a very courageous protester, had their phone in their hand just sort of swinging by their side as though it wasn't recording, but it was recording. And we see this heavily armed, heavily armoured police officer, you'll see him in Battleground Melbourne if you watch my documentary, and he says to this protester, he says, go home or else we'll start, we'll start making arrests. We don't want to do it, but we will. And the protester says, well, if you don't want to do it, then don't do it. And this police officer says, well, unfortunately, at this time of my life, I'm not skilled to do anything else. And I've got to put food on the table because my wife's not working. So this is what I have to do. And they remonstrated for a little while and then, and then they went their separate ways. And I think about that officer quite often because the situation that he was put in was really a choice that no one should be forced to make. It was a choice between obeying his conscience, which was telling him, don't issue arrests, don't, don't issue fines, don't participate in this. And it was a choice between that and, and his responsibilities as a man, as a father, to provide for his kids, to provide for his wife, to make sure the bills are paid. And what happened, and this is, comes back to the psychology again, Daniel Andrews, the Premier of Victoria, weaponized people's families against their consciences, weaponized their responsibilities against their consciences. And that was the case for a lot of police officers. There were a lot of police officers who were on the front lines who did not want to be there. And I'll, I'll, I'll finish my answer with one more anecdote. The same day that Anna was thrown to the ground, the 70-year-old in, in, in a red trench coat, actually almost at the same time, I was at the other end of our bunch and uh, some of the men had just pushed their way through a police line. We'd, we'd become trapped in a steep-sided canyon. Again, you'll see it all in, in Battleground Melbourne. They were raining pepper spray and tear gas down on us from above. They were moving in from behind with multiple lines of police officers with truncheons, just basically striking anyone that, that didn't get out of the way fast enough. Anna, for her part, actually turned towards them and walked towards them in kind of a surrender position because uh, she was exhausted. We'd, we'd, we'd marched for miles away from the police. We were always going away from the police because we didn't want trouble and they were always chasing us because they did want trouble. And... So she tried to surrender, and that's when she got thrown to the ground and hospitalised for no reason. And I joined the stampede at the other end. Some of the men had pushed their way through a police line that was only a single layer deep, and there was this just a stampede that happened. And I joined that to get out of that kettle, to get out of that trap and get out of the tear gas and everything else that was going on. And there was a real crush of people. You didn't really get to pick where you ran. You just kind of had to not get, try not to get knocked over in the, in the crush of people. And the line that I was kind of jostled onto by the people around me took me straight towards a police officer. And she was still on her feet and she was swinging her baton and she was hitting people as they ran past her. I, why? I, what, what, what do you get out of that? I don't know. But that's what she was doing and I was being pushed straight towards her. And I can remember raising my arm and holding my arm elbow high like this, just trying to protect the top of my head with my forearm and the front of my head with the back of my arm and just thinking, well, a broken arm is better than a broken skull. You know, that's, that was literally my thought process as I was barging my way through. And I, I managed to not hit her. I didn't want to run into her and knock her over. I managed to, to get next to her. And she hit me with the baton. And it's, it's a weird thing to explain. Because in that moment, there was no energy in that baton at all. There was no strength in her wrist. It literally just kind of, kind of pressed against my arm and then just kind of slid off in almost this forlorn kind of way. And I actually felt enormously sorry for her in that moment. It's a weird thing to say. But she was bewildered. She was broken. She didn't know why she was there. She didn't know why she was doing what she was doing. She was just doing the thing that she thought she was expected to do. Um, and it was, it was quite a bewildering thing for me then. And, and that left an enormous impression on me. And I found out later that that particular line of, of single, single layer deep of police officers that we'd broken through or the, or the, other, the other men had broken through uh, was actually mostly made up of people freshly out of the academy.
And uh, this was, they were in their first weeks or first months of policing. And I'm led to believe that the vast majority of them then resigned from the police force after that particular day and that particular incident. And I would imagine that she was probably one of them because uh, certainly she was she was a lost soul in that moment. And it's, just, it's a weird thing to say, but the way she hit me, um, she was a lost soul and she had no idea why she was there anymore. Mm-hmm. We'll just maybe briefly refer to the psychology. I mean, the people that will come to my mind are people like Stanley Milgram and Solomon Ash. What, 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 what psychologists have come to your mind? Oh, well, I, I actually, I, I thought very deeply about this for a long time because I was trying to understand why why people changed so much and why people enjoyed it so much. Like what happened inside people's heads that they enjoyed being locked down so much? And I realized the answer for me, at least, lies in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is that sort of triangular thing that you would have seen in high school or university. And it sort of charts the the needs that you have as a human being. At the bottom is your physiological needs, oxygen, water, shelter, food, uh, as you move up, you start to get to very much uh, relational needs, psychosocial needs, status. These things start to come into it. And then once you get to the very top, you have a thing that Maslow called self-actualization, which is basically living your best life. You are satisfied and fulfilled in every imaginable way. And so what happens in the Western world, most of us are clumped around the middle somewhere, some higher, some lower, but we're all roughly in the middle of, of Maslow's hierarchy. And lockdowns come along and a whole bunch of people are pushed towards the bottom. That's obvious, the ones that are self-employed or lose their businesses or various other things like that. A lot of people are devastated by lockdowns and suddenly they're struggling for survival. They're closer to the bottom than they've ever been before. They're not the interesting ones. That's obvious. We, we know what happens to them. The interesting ones are the ones that are, let's say, laptop workers or they're on welfare or they're retired. They didn't lose their income. They're not shoved towards the bottom anymore. What's interesting about them is they don't just stay where they are. They're actually given an opportunity to move to the very, very top. And this is where Daniel Andrews was incredibly sophisticated in his political messaging. He was doing press conferences every single day at 11 o'clock. And he would make minute adjustments to the lockdown rules at every at every one of those press conferences. He would announce how many cases there had been, how many deaths there had been, you know, da, 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 a whole bunch of information. It could have been an email. You know, that classic someone calls a meeting. It could have been an email. He, every single one of those press, press conferences could have been an email. But he would make these minute adjustments to the rules and he would use very Orwellian language. Staying apart keeps us together. Staying home saves lives. We're all in this together. Uh, You're a part of a team that is fighting this once-in-a-lifetime war against a pandemic. A lot of us and them language. You're you're doing the right thing and you need to be dobbing in the people that are are doing the wrong thing. There was a lot of that sort of language throughout these press conferences. And what I realized was what he had done is he had weaponized slacktivism. You know how people put you know, rings around their profile pictures on social media or, or you know, they wear lapel pins or put bumper stickers on. It's the easiest thing in the world to, virtue, to signal your virtue. What he did was he weaponized that. And he, he said, you can be virtuous just by sitting at home and watching a press conference at 11 a.m. every day. And what happened was people bought into that emotionally and intellectually and they went, well, I'm part of the team, which means I belong. I'm fighting a war against a pandemic, which means my life has meaning. And they started to climb their way up Maslow's hierarchy of needs step by step. And in the end, what I realized was there were a couple of million people in Melbourne who were actually living the most fulfilled purpose-driven life with the greatest sense of belonging that they have ever had in their lives and probably ever will have ever again. For them, the end of lockdowns, the end of the us and them, the end of that artificial inflated sense of purpose and meaning is devastating. And so when you or I come along with evidence and facts and studies and we say, well, yes, but what about? Well, for them, it's not about that at all. It never was. You're calling into question the best years of their life the best years they've ever had, and most of them know the best years that they will ever have, and they can't allow you to do that. And that's why people refuse to be influenced by the evidence. It's about how they felt and the fact that for a moment in time, they were at the very, very top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. Is the sanctity of life under threat more so than it ever has been in history, do you think? So this is where I am going to get a little bit controversial. Uh, I believe that we are seeing a resurgence of essentially death cults, Moloch worship, the idea that death is a solution, death is a, a, a sacrifice. Uh, 
And, and I, let me buttress that by, by saying, well, Moloch worship has taken many different forms in different cultures. They haven't all called Moloch by the same name, but we see from the Southern American continent through to you know, ancient uh, tribes, and we see it in the Bible and other historical documents, this idea that sacrificing a human being to a god is going to give you a better harvest. You're going to have a better life. You're going to have victory in war. There are various reasons and contexts in which we will we will actively kill an, another human being in some way or other. And it seems to me that environmentalism today has morphed into a death cult. And, and that's a very, very strong language. I recognize that. But I, I genuinely believe that that's what we've seen. And let me explain that a couple of different ways. Firstly, this idea that mankind is a virus on the face of the planet, this equating us not only with just sort of a common biological thing, but actually one that ultimately kills its host and is, is the source of, of a great many problems. This idea of overpopulation, we saw Paul Ehrlich talk about this in the population bomb, and of course he's, he's been dem demonstrably wrong uh, ever since he, he authored that. But there is this idea that the sheer number of people is a big problem. We see it being spoken of at the World Economic Forum. We see it being spoken of in various sort of seats of power, the ones that we talked about earlier. They're talking about humankind as though its existence is inherently a bad thing and a problem. That's at the macro level, but we can come right down to the individual level. And we see with the issue of human abortion, a very emotional one and a touchy one, and apologies to anyone that doesn't like hearing about it, but we see the promise of abortion is if you kill that baby, fetus, whatever, whatever you believe it is, if you kill that baby, you'll be able to finish university and you'll have a better life and a bigger income. And I see a lot of parallels between this and if you sacrifice that virgin, you'll have a better harvest. There's, they're, they're not the same thing, but I see some, some very disturbing parallels. We see now with euthanasia that death is being promoted increasingly as a solution. We see it now not only for the elderly, the infirm, the ones that have no hope of recovery, but now we're beginning to see, oh, they're in their mid-30s, but they're depressed. And we've tried lots of different medications, so you know, we, we've, we've approved their euthanasia. And we're beginning to see things like that now. I would also, to get really controversial argue that we actually see an extension of this idea in the, the transgender movement because a post-operative transgender will never continue their bloodline. They, they may have had kids already, but once they become post-operative, they're not able to continue their bloodline. They're not able to continue to procreate. And to me, what, what we've seen is a coalescing of a whole bunch of progressive ideas, these ideas that in various ways have pushed back against conservatism, the idea that, that you know, mankind was created in the image of God and was given instructions to fill, to multiply, to fill the earth and to subdue it, these sort of Judeo-Christian ideas. We see a coalescing of a lot of the rejection of that turning into and coalescing around this idea that the death of humans is good, the reduction in the number of humans uh, is, is an inherently good thing. And I associate that with the environmental movement for a very specific reason. The environmental movement began with concern over specific environmental issues, you know, oil and industrial waste in rivers and various things that were largely quantifiable. They, you could measure them. You could sue a company, make them clean it up, and then you could send people in to actually measure whether they'd done the job properly. A lot of they, they had a number of great victories, and a lot of those issues were, you know, either cleaned up or being cleaned up. And, and a lot of those really glaring issues began to be non-issues, and so they went looking for new issues to justify their existence. But what's difficult is measuring environmental outcomes in these much more nebulous ways, where the, the harm is not as crystal clear. I read a really, really fascinating book written by Professor Ainsley Kello from the University of Tasmania. It's called Science and Public Policy. The Virtuous Corruption of Virtual Environmental Sciences. Long title, fascinating book. I think you can still find it online, but it's about $250. There's, there's so few of them left in the world. Uh, and I have a copy, and I'm never, no, I'm not loaning it to you. I'm hanging onto that thing for dear life. Um, and what he discusses in there is the way that virtuous corruption has corrupted the environmental movement. And what virtuous corruption is, is where people will lie for a good cause. So take, for example, um, Al Gore, former vice president, former presidential candidate. He's on the public record saying that he knows that some of what he says is not true. But if I don't exaggerate, then people won't take the problem seriously. So that's virtuous corruption. I'm exaggerating. I'm lying. I'm not being honest. But it's for a virtuous cause. So I'm still the good guy here. And that's crept in. And, and Professor Ainsley Keller makes a wonderful series of arguments to show how that has actually become the dominant factor in environmentalism. And so we have environmentalism that's driven by ideology and very, very hard to measure positive outcomes. 
And this is where the long march through the institution comes in. We'll start tying some threads together from our chat because we have all of these people from from the long march through the institutions that have <clears throat> found in the environmental movement a vehicle by which to advance their their agenda. And so we have a lot of uh, what I call watermelons. They're green on the outside. They're, re- they're red on the inside. I didn't coin the phrase, but I've, I've, I heard it one time, and I think it's brilliant. So they're, they're red on the inside, but they wear that green cloak because it makes them more socially acceptable. And what they have realized is it's hard to measure good environmental outcomes. But they've bought into the idea of a zero-sum game. An environmental benefit must come at human expense. And if humans are benefiting, then it must have come at environmental expense. There's this sort of zero-sum game mentality that has crept in to a lot of environmental thinking. And that is a wonderful shortcut for them because they get to go, well, now we don't have to measure environmental outcomes. If we can just damage the economy, if we can just have all those evil capitalists screaming at us about how much harm we're doing to capitalism, how much money we're costing people, well, that can be presumed to be good for the environment. And this is where we've seen the environmental movement largely, but also some other aspects of of the modern culture, have actually become anti-human. And they view that as a good thing. When, When we turn around and say, oh, you can't, You can't shut down those coal mines. You're going to put all those people out of work. That's not a bad thing in their view. Human suffering, a reduction in human quality of life and standard of living, is actually one of the ways by which they measure their success. So, again, coming back to your question, are we seeing a a sort of a a death cult rise? Yes, in the most literal sense possible, in my opinion, uh, but also just more broadly an anti-human cult that views death as one of the solutions, but also just a lower standard of living uh, lower quality of life, shorter life expectancy that always follows a lower quality of life, and views that as a positive thing, as, a, as an actual, like a virtuous thing. Heck of a lot to think about there, Topher. Thank you very much. Just just give us a takeaway and maybe some intimation of how you see the future unfolding. Yeah, well, this is a good one. Uh, you know, I guess it sort of, it all begs the question, what do we do about it? Um, you know, yes, good people break bad laws. Okay, what do we do about that? What does that mean in practice? You know, yes, COVID was yet another example of people trying to centralize power and take control over our lives. If, even if we all accept that that's true, what do we do about it? What's, what does this mean? And I want to go back to the police officer that I mentioned earlier, the one who was saying, you know, I don't want to arrest you, but I will. And then when he was challenged, hey, you don't have to do that. He said, well, I do have to do that because I've got to provide for my family. I've got to provide for my kids. We all have things in our life that will cause us or will tempt us, I should say, to do the wrong thing for the right reasons. He was this police officer saying, I have to do something that violates my conscience for the right reasons, for my family, for my wife, for my kids. And we all have those things, those areas of dependency. Um, you know, it might be your job, it might be your health care, it might be your living circumstances, your, your, your child's school, these sorts of things, uh, your banking situation. We all have vulnerabilities in our life. And if we are going to see in the future things like climate lockdowns, which you know, are being discussed, it's not a conspiracy theory, they're being discussed. We're seeing experimentation with things like 15-minute cities and other things like that, the ultra-low emission zones, Sadiq Khan's ultra-low emission zones in London that then spawned the Blade Runners. I mean, talk about an example of, of civil disobedience. They are right up against that line of what is or is not acceptable. I won't dive down that rabbit hole just here. But, but this issue of civil disobedience and what is appropriate and what is not and what is a bad law and what is not is not going away anytime soon. And my piece of advice to each and every person would be self-assess your own life. What are your vulnerabilities? If you were put into the position that that police officer was put into, where you're being given orders or you're being, you know, laws are being passed that you don't want to obey, that your conscience tells you you should disobey, you should become one of the good people who break bad laws, what would that narrative in the back of your mind be saying, oh, no, you better not because X, Y, or Z? That's that vulnerability. That's that that temptation to compromise on your conscience, potentially for the best of reasons, exactly like that police officer did. And so my challenge to myself and to each and every one of us is to audit your own life and have a think about what your vulnerabilities are and what that narrative in your mind would be and decide to fix those things in advance so that when your test comes, when you have that moment in time where, where you have to make a decision between doing what's easy and doing what's right, that you've already addressed the easy. Uh, You've already addressed the things that would make that hard if you did what was right. Uh, 
and therefore you've removed those temptations to, to compromise. When we started speaking out against COVID lockdowns in Melbourne, I spoke at the very first anti-lockdown protest. It was April 25th, 2020, a day that I will never forget. And 70 of us showed up in a park. There were 70. A few months later, there were about 400 of us regularly. A few months after that, there were a few thousand of us. And it took 18 months before we finally had over 100,000 people and we forced the government to back down. We forced them to finally end the lockdowns, end the police brutality, uh, and, and people were free after that point in time. And the question that kind of haunts me is, what if we'd had a few thousand from the very start instead of 70? What if it had taken us six months to get to 100,000 people instead of six months to get to 1,000 people? How much shorter would that suffering have been? And I talked to so many people who say, oh, I wish I'd had the courage to get out there with you. I saw you guys, I saw the social media, I wanted to go and join you, but I was too scared or I couldn't take the risk because of any one of a number of different reasons. And I accept that not everyone can do what I did. That's, that's not, not everyone's temperamentally capable and not everyone's situation allows it. I get that. But if we'd had a lot more people willing, ready and able to do what I did and what, what those other 70 people did on that very first day, then the suffering of six and a half million Victorians and four and a half million Melbournians would have been cut much, much shorter. Uh, and the world, our world that we had to live in through 2020 and 2021 would have been a much uh, better place than what it was. So my agenda now is to get people to think it through. Make decisions now, fix those temptations now, so that when your test comes, you can do what your conscience requires you to do. Uh, and I have, I have a saying, uh, there's a stage, a stage um, speech that I do with, with a couple of other survivors from the Battleground Melbourne era. It's called Battleground Melbourne Live. We did it for CPAC Australia a couple of years ago. And at the end of that, I say this, and I, I want to leave everyone with this. There's nothing particularly special about me or the others that stood with me. We are ordinary people, but we were faced with extraordinary times. And we, all we did was make the courageous decision to do what was right, even when our government was wrong. And all we need to change the world, to stop all these evil you know, people that want to control us, the centralization of power, the censorship, everything else, all we need is to have more ordinary people to be willing to make those courageous decisions and do what is right, even when the government is wrong. And that's it. If we can get that, these problems go away. For now, Topher Field in Australia, Thank you so much. You've given us a, a lot of your day. Links to the resources that you mentioned, of course, will be in the description of the video. But for now, thank you very much for sharing your uh, detailed and well thought out uh, thinking and strategies. Thank you. I appreciate it, John.